Mr. Harrison was back to normal in a few days and telling everyone of Rusty's barbaric behavior. If he wants to live like an animal, he can. He left my house of his own free will and I feel no responsibility for him. It's his own fault if he starves to death. The missionary's wife said, But I do hope you will forgive him if he returns. I will, madam. I have to. I'm his legal guardian. And I hope he doesn't return. Oh, Mr. Harrison, he's only a boy. That's what you think. I'm sure he'll come back. Mr. Harrison shrugged indifferently. Rusty's thoughts were far from his guardian. He was listening to Meena Kapoor tell him about his room, and he gazed into her eyes all the time she talked. It is a very nice room, she said, but of course there is no water or electricity or lavatory. Rusty was bathing in the brown pools of her eyes. She said, You will have to collect your water at the big tank, and for the rest you will have to do it in the jungle. Rusty thought he saw his own gaze reflected in her eyes. Yes, he said. You can give Kishan his lessons in the morning until 12 o'clock, then no more, then you have your food. Then, he watched the movement of her lips. Then nothing. You do what you like, go out with Kishan or Somi or any of your friends. Where do I teach Kishan? On the roof, of course. Rusty retrieved his gaze and scratched his head. The roof seemed a strange place for setting up a school. Why the roof? Because your room is on the roof. Mina led the boy round the house until they came to a flight of steps, unsheltered, that went up to the roof. They had to hop over a narrow drain before climbing the steps. This drain, warned Mina, is very easy to cross, but when you are coming downstairs, be sure not to take too big a step because then you might bump the wall on the other side or fall over the stove, which is usually there. I'll be careful, said Rusty. They began climbing, Mina in the lead. Rusty watched Mina's long, slender feet. The slippers she wore consisted only of two straps that passed between her toes, and the backs of the slippers slapped against her heels like Somi's. Only the music, like the feet, was different. Another thing about these steps, continued Mina, there are 22 of them. No, don't count. I have already done so. But remember, if you are coming home in the dark, be sure you take only 22 steps, because if you don't, then, and she snapped her fingers in the air, you'll be finished. After 22 steps, you turn right and you find the door. Here it is. If you do not turn right and you take 23 steps, you will go over the edge of the roof. They both laughed, and suddenly Mina took Rusty's hand and led him into the room. It was a small room, but this did not matter much, as there was very little in it. Only a string bed, a table, a shelf, and a few nails in the wall. In comparison to Rusty's room in his guardian's house, it wasn't even a room. It was four walls, a door, and a window. The door looked out on the roof, and Mina pointed through it at the big round water tank. That is where you bathe and get your water, she said. I know, I went with Sony. There was a big mango tree behind the tank, and Kishin was sitting in its branches, watching them. Surrounding the house were a number of lychee trees, and in the summer, they and the mango would bear fruit. Mina and Rusty stood by the window in silence, hand in hand. Rusty was prepared to stand there, holding hands forever. Mina felt a sisterly affection for him, but he was stumbling into love. From the window they could see many things. In the distance, towering over the other trees, was the flame of the forest, its flowers glowing red-hot against the blue of the sky. Through the window came a shoot of pink bougainvillea creeper, and Rusty knew he would never cut it, and so he knew he would never be able to shut the window. Mina said, If you do not like it, we will find another. Rusty squeezed her hand and smiled into her eyes and said, But I like it. This is the room I want to live in. 
And do you know why, Mina? Because it isn't a real room, that's why. The afternoon was warm, and Rusty sat beneath the big banyan tree that grew behind the house, a tree that was almost a house in itself. Its spreading branches drooped to the ground and took new root, forming a maze of pillared passages. The tree sheltered scores of birds and squirrels. A squirrel stood in front of Rusty. It looked at him from between its legs, its tail in the air, back arched gracefully, and nose quivering excitedly. Hello, said Rusty. The squirrel brushed its nose with its forepaw, winked at the boy, hopped over his leg, and ran up a pillar of the banyan tree. Rusty leaned back against the broad trunk of the banyan and listened to the lazy drone of the bees, the squeaking of the squirrels and the incessant bird talk. He thought of Mina and of Kishin and felt miserably happy. And then he remembered Somi and the chat shop. The chatwala, that god of the tikkis, handed Rusty a leaf bowl and prepared alu chole. First sliced potatoes, then peas, then red and gold chili powders, then a sprinkling of juices. Then he shook it all up and down in the leaf bowl and in a simplicity the alu chole was ready. Somi removed his slippers, crossed his legs and looked a question. It's fine, said Rusty. You are sure? There was concern in Somi's voice and his eyes seemed to hesitate a little before smiling with the mouth. It's fine, said Rusty. I'll soon get used to the room. There was a silence. Rusty concentrated on the alu chole, feeling guilty and ungrateful. Ranbir has gone, said Somi. Oh, he didn't even say goodbye. He has not gone forever, and anyway, what would be the use of saying goodbye? He sounded depressed. He finished his alu chole and said, Rusty, best favorite friend, if you don't want this job, I'll find you another. But I like it, Somi. I want it. Really, I do. You are trying to do too much for me. Mrs. Kapoor is wonderful, and Mr. Kapoor is good fun, and Kishan is not so bad, you know. Come on to the house and see the room. It's the kind of room in which you write poetry or create music. They walked home in the evening. The evening was full of sounds. Rusty noticed the sounds because he was happy, and a happy person notices things. Carriages passed them on the road, creaking and rattling, wheels squeaking, hoofs resounding on the ground, and the whip cracks above the horse's ear, and the driver shouts, and round go the wheels, squeaking and creaking, and the hoofs go clippity clippity clip clop clop. A bicycle came swishing through the puddles, the wheels whirring and humming smoothly, the bell tinkling. In the bushes, there was the chatter of sparrows and seven sisters, but Rusty could not see them, no matter how hard he looked. And there were footsteps, their own footsteps, quiet and thoughtful, and ahead of them an old man with a dhoti round his legs and a black umbrella in his hand walking at a clockwork pace. At each alternate step he tapped with his umbrella on the pavement. He wore noisy shoes and his footsteps echoed off the pavement to the beat of the umbrella. Rusty and Somi quickened their own steps, passed him by and let the endless tapping die on the wind. They sat on the roof for an hour watching the sun set and Somi sang. Somi had a beautiful voice, clear and mellow, matching the serenity of his face, and when he sang, his eyes wandered into the night, and he was lost to the world and to Rusty, for when he sang of the stars, he was of the stars, and when he sang of a river, he was a river. He communicated his mood to Rusty, as he could not have done in plain language, and when the song ended, the silence returned and all the world fell asleep.